Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to part two of Under the Hood uh, with LiveVert, Nova, and KVM. Um, the last time I presented was in Atlanta, and I hope you guys had a chance to view the YouTube video. Uh, if not, I have links all throughout, and I'm referencing everything via tiny URL if you want to go pull these up. I'm also going to post the slides once the presentation is complete. So don't worry too much about taking pictures of any of this. It'll all be up on the OpenStax site, and I'm sure the YouTube video will be up uh, as well. Part one's slides uh, are all there as well. Uh, I'm going to do my best to cover as much as I can, but as it turns out, this is a pretty deep topic. Uh, so chances are we will need a part three. Uh, so if there's interest in that, I'll submit for it for the next summit, and we'll continue uh, on this topic and continue diving in uh, to, to this. So a quick review. Uh, the last summit and the last, the last time we did this talk, we went through the high-level flow of all the various operations that one would perform uh, via the compute driver, uh, diving into a decent amount of depth going through the flow. Um, so what, we're gonna, we, what we covered was spawn, reboot, hard and soft, uh, suspend, live migration, and a couple other things, and not didn't really get into suspend at the level that I'd like to. Um, I wanted to do that today, but we're not going to have time for it, so maybe the, the next talk. So the, the one point that I noted and continued to emphasize during the talk last time was how critical it is to actually read the code. Uh, and I'm going to emphasize that today, but the important part of today is explaining how it is you go about reading the code. Because as it turns out, no matter how much we cover this topic in, in 35 or 40 minute sessions, it's not going to be as valuable as you understanding how and where to get the information that you need. Uh, because it's also changing quite rapidly. A lot of the assumptions today are based on the ICEHOUSE code base. Uh, a lot of that is going to continue to hold true for Juno. Um, but uh, as I'll continue to emphasize, it's important to review this on a regular basis to ensure that what you're, what you're talking about and that your assumptions continue to hold true. So understanding the code, I, I'm going to walk through some of the Nova code and libvirt code to explain how it is you follow the code through uh, OpenStack and through libvirt. So read the code. I can't emphasize this enough. As much as the documentation team stays on top of everything that's happening within Nova and OpenStack, there's such a, a, a matrix of configuration options that it's basically impossible to test for all variants of that. Um, Gate continues to expand. The variants that are tested continue to expand. But that's generally uh, encompassing new hypervisors, new drivers, um, rather than additional configuration options, where a subset or a change in configuration options can dramatically alter the code paths and flow uh, through the libvirt driver as they do for other sections of, of Nova. So really what it is is prior to going and enabling or disabling a feature or changing uh, one of the, the various options that are available as configuration, make sure you're going through and reading the code. The, the, the methods and operations are also pretty frequently refactored. So at the last talk, I covered sort of how resizes work and how many times data is copied back and forth. That's already changed uh, in the Juno cycle. So that's become a lot more efficient. And the only way to really know that, it's sometimes noted in the release notes, but it's really to go through and, and look at the code. And then, yeah, so the, the number of options that are there from the standpoint of just the libvirt driver, if you were to go, go look at the libvirt subsection of the config file, is so vast that it can completely change how robust and how resilient the configuration of the, the uh, deployment ends up being. So the, really, the only way to, to understand what's going on there is to, to follow it. So first, some basic architecture and how we're, we're flowing through all of this, this code. So at the top here, we're looking at Nova Compute. So we're only focusing on uh, on the detail from the context of a particular hypervisor uh, in this case. Going up much further would be a longer talk. So Nova Compute has two major components or, or classes that we're going to be talking about today. And that's the manager and the driver itself, which then call into libvirt 
um, which are then talking to basically QMU, which, has, which is managing what, what are called domains. And domains, uh, as most of you are aware, are the terminology that's used for defining an individual instance. And there'll be multiple domains on a given hypervisor. So first, let's talk about, in terms of a code standpoint, the Libver Python API. Uh, why do we care about it? Well, it's important to understand how Libvirt is making the calls into the API so that you can really read the driver code. Uh, because ultimately, or in most cases, what you're going to find is that a, a Libvirt call is made. Um, by and large, this will hold through to, throughout the code. And you can see references. I have links up. I just checked one of the links. Unfortunately, the Libvirt site is not rendering it. But normally, it will render. And that's the API link. So the important thing to note when you're looking at the API link is the reference that's listed there is the C library reference. If you're just to eliminate the ver on the front and lowercase the next, the next letter in the call, and I'll show examples of this, uh, the Python API is exactly the same as the, as the C API. So just going through that reference can give you a good idea of what the capabilities are. Um, and any sample code that I'm showing here, it's really simple samples that if you happen to have a dev stack that is running uh, uh, hypervisors or running uh, instances can, uh, can be executed on them to return back some subset of, of output as is being produced by some of the code. So the first is a connection object. So to do anything with libvirt, to get started with this at all, we need a connection object. So you can see the code for doing this is incredibly simple. Uh, the URL is just, at this point, we're pointing at the local system. And there's a couple of different ways to point at it. So you can do a TCP session, for example, or a TLS session. Um, but this is just the simplest example by far. Uh, you create the connection. And then once you've got the connection object, you can start making calls into libvirt that are intended to be executed on the, uh, the connection object. So in this case, we're simply making a call to get the version, and you'll get the, the response back, and it'll be the version of QMU that happens to be deployed on the system. The next type of object, and this is the more interesting type that we'll be doing and showing more operations against, is a domain object. So this represents an object associated with a single instance. Again, as we're going through the Nova code, this will become a lot more relevant because as you're seeing calls made by the Nova libvirt driver, they're all made on domain objects or connection objects that are pre-established for you uh, as part of uh, instantiating the class. So you can see this is a pretty simple uh, code sample as well where we're creating a connection object. And all we're doing is, is calling uh, list domains by ID, which is going to return a list to us iterating over it and printing the name of the domain as well as the UUID. So again, uh, I encourage you, if you've got a dev stack, to later uh, uh, you know, instantiate it. Go ahead and run this. You can safely run this on any system that's, that's running libvirt and QMU. So now that we've got that, uh, we can start talking about how the integration occurs from the perspective of Nova and start looking at some of the calls to understand how it is that we're getting into libvirt. So again, the two important files that we're talking about here, and if you traverse into the Nova tree, it can be pretty daunting, because um, the code base is a couple hundred thousand lines at this point when you're considering tests as well. So it's manager and the driver itself. So the driver methods are where we're going to where we're going to focus uh, uh, the, the most uh, today. And the first example we'll start off with, and and only because it's really simple, is pause. So first, how are we getting into the driver? Now, if you were to go look at the manager code and trace it down to the pause operation. And this code is pulled literally from uh, upstream Icehouse. So you can just browse the GitHub repository and navigate to this and find this section of code. The part that's highlighted there is driver.pause. Uh, I wanted to also show, and you, could, you would have to go scroll up a little bit to the top of the file in that code to see how the driver object's instantiated. But for, for the sake of this discussion, the driver object's instantiated for you, and it's going to call the libvirt driver. So you can see that's really simple. All it's doing is calling dot pause. So it's going to call the pause method in the driver object and pass the instance into it. That's it. 
So from this point on, the rest that's outside of this is not dealing with the driver itself. Now, what does the driver piece look like? Now, this is where we start to see how simple a lot of this is. And LiveVert really is, is what's making this simple for us because it's going and doing all the heavy lifting to talk to the QMU monitor uh, and be able to actually execute on these operations. So pause. All that's being happened there is the first thing that's, th that's uh, done is there's a, a wrapper around the call to return the domain object. So look up by name. If you go look at that code, it's simple wrapper that goes and says exactly that. It calls libvert with lookup by name and says, gives the, the name of the instance, which then returns the domain object. So assume now you've got a domain object, and all you're calling is uh, suspend on the domain object, and you're done. So you've got pause and unpause there. They're both really simple. And again, I only put this up as an example because it's simple, not because uh, I, I feel that pause is a, is a particularly useful operation. Uh, a couple of additional locations that are used by the libvert driver. There's a, there's a whole subdirectory for everything that's libvert related. And I would say that the, the files I've got listed up there, config.py, image backend, um, volume, and utils are probably the ones that you'll be touching the most often. So config.py is what's responsible for generating the objects or classes and, and subclasses that are then converted to XML and passed into libvert. So everything is, is done via XML, and I'll talk about that in a second. And config.py is what's responsible for, for executing on that. Uh, image backend is intended to abstract a lot of the disk-based and image-based operations on the backend. As it so turns out, uh, and again, I will show an example of this, it doesn't, it doesn't completely abstract all the operations. So for example, today, there's a raw interface there. There's a QCOW interface, and there's an, there's an RBD interface and an uh, LVM interface. Ideally, you would have nothing that touches the disk go through anything aside from the uh, image backend class, but that doesn't actually hold true. You will see as you're going through many of the, the calls, like we just looked at pause, you'll see actual operations on disk which are occurring, which are not going through image backend, and that poses all kinds of problems. So there's work being done there to improve on this and abstract it further. In fact, it's going in a different direction, but it's, that's for another talk. The, at a high level, it'll eventually be going through libvert and storage pools, so even that level of abstraction will not be occurring in Nova. It'll be handed off to libvert. So uh, I'm sure that warrants a, a talk all on its own. And then uh, each of the volume interfaces for Cinder have a corresponding client driver that's present in volume.py. And then utils.py, you can just, it's, it's all the functions that are generally being used by libvert over and over, the libvert driver um, throughout the code base. So domains, libvert domains. As I talked about briefly with domains, they're simply just instances. So if you go on a hypervisor and do a verse list, um, all you're going to get back is the list of instances that are running on that particular hypervisor. So w a little bit more about domains. First, they're all defined via XML. Um, and you can find the XML reference. I put it up here as well. Because everything that's happening from the perspective of libvert and everything that it cares about is done via XML. All of the communication Nova does with libvert is done via XML. And then from there, libvert actually takes the complicated part and talks to QMU Monitor um, over its, its QMP. It's a, it's a separate protocol that libvert is opening connections into uh, and handling all that for you. So if you were to look at the domain XML, a lot of ways you can backwards in, interpolate what it is that's being done and defined by Nova. I'll pull up an example here in a second. But that's going to define the configuration of that instance. Uh, including any volumes and any changes that have been made during runtime of that instance by Nova. So uh, there are a couple different types of domains. There are transient and persistent domains. It's basically, is that domain going to stay defined and present after the instance is destroyed? And destroyed is a soft destroy. It just means that it's no longer running. Um, and then there's transient, which means it goes away after a destroy is executed. Everything that's done by Nova is done persistently. 
Um, XML is, is continuously regenerated. So if for whatever reason you went in and edited libverts XML for a running domain, it'll get blown away the next time. So that's done for a number of reasons. Uh, one, to deal with any potential issues that may have come up. Maybe something got corrupted. It's, it's unlikely for that to happen. More commonly, it's someone went in and changed something by hand, and this will discourage uh, any amount of that. So hard reboot will always regenerate the XML, which is most relevant, actually, when you've made a change in how the compute driver is to operate, and the change generates a different set of XML, doing a hard reboot is the only way to apply that change to the instance. Um, and then an important set of logs that's frequently overlooked is, are the libvirt logs. Generally, you will get a response back, or Nova will, to its logs so that it can report what, it, what error libvirt happened to report as part of the failure, if there was one. But sometimes you do actually need to go look at the libvirt log, and this is the default location on Ubuntu. It shouldn't be that hard to find on, on RHEL. Um, but if you go and look in there, there's an instance name log for, for each and every domain that's ever run on, on that hypervisor. So that's the other key. Um, things are not necessarily cleaned up, but you have all the data there. And if you're troubleshooting, that's the, that's the other place to go and look to see what it is QMU sometimes responded back with and told you. So sometimes it might tell you there was some issue uh, with the arguments that you passed in, there was some contention, whatever it is, it's going to be reported there. Um, a quick reference of Versh as well. Versh is, by contrast of the Python API, the command line tool that's going to be used uh, for doing anything natively on the hypervisor. Uh, anyone who's done much with libvirt has, has worked with Versh. And I won't go through each of these, but basically these are a, a couple of really simple operations that you can run. A lot of people don't know about DOM name, which is really important. And the reason that's important is everything that we're doing from a Nova standpoint these days is in UUIDs. As soon as you get on the hypervisor, you do a verse list, you don't see UUIDs. You see domain names. And they're not domain names based on what the user put in. It's programmatically de defined domain names. So how do you take and operate or know what you're dealing with? You can do a DOM name on the UUID and get that back and then start operating on the, on the correct instance. So, Libvirt takes all the XML that you've defined as part of the do domain and it creates uh, a command line uh, or a set of arguments to call QMU with. And I'll show you guys that in, in just a second. If you were to look at the QMU command line and the possibilities for what can be executed, there's quite a lot there. Um, so Libvirt deals with all of that. Now, of course, after Libvirt has, been, has executed QMU, there's no way to alter the command line. So the rest of the operations that are then modifying or changing the running QMU process are done via uh, QMP and the, the, and the QMU uh, monitor protocol. So Libvirt actually has connections open to each domain's uh, QMU monitor socket and is executing those commands uh, as needed. Um, so the XML that's fed in actually to, uh, by Nova into libvirt isn't what you'll see if you were to do a dump XML. And that's another interesting part of what libvirt's handling for us. Some of the values that are presented and need to be, need to be utilized when calling QMU uh, are incremented. For example, uh, bus IDs, uh, a couple different places where that occurs. And you can see that once you take the XML that's generated by Nova, and put it into libvirt, what you end up with is basically what re represents an active domain. And it's the same thing when you, when you start a domain and then you shut it down. What you see in terms of the XML is different. Uh, and you can pretty easily do a comparison of an active and an in inactive domain to see what parts of the domain are actually being handled for you and, and what parts libvirt's actually taking care of uh, interpolating for you. So here's an, a, an example of some of the XML. It's just a part of it. It's pretty easy to go and look at one that's running on a, a, a dev stack instance or a, a production environment just by doing a dump XML. So that's what we've got here. This is out of a, a QMU 1.5 instance. And we just got a few values here to define sort of the CPU modes and some of the basics like the UUID. Uh, this is a much larger file generally, but just gives you an idea. And then 
If you were talking to QMU directly, this is the sort of command line argument you would be coming up with. Um, the, the, the reason I make this point is I frequently hear the question asked of why is libvert in the mix here? Why don't we just talk to QMU? This is why. Um, these arguments change from version to version as well, which is another thing people don't know about what libvert's doing. So if you've got QMU 1.2 and 1.5 and 2.0, the best practices and arguments between those versions change. And libvert knows how to deal with that. So it'll pass the correct things according to the version it knows it's talking to. Um, so all the XML for each of the instances uh, that are running across your entire cloud are available in the instances directory. There's a libvert.xml file in the instances directory for each instance. And you can go take a look at that one. You can delete it if you want. It has no relevance on the runtime at all. Nova does everything it needs to in memory and passes it into libvert during, uh, during the definition. Um, but you can play around with it, and if you needed to administratively define that instance on a different hypervisor, that's how you'd go about doing that. Some uh, important libvert configuration that, that we discovered just in terms of the concurrency. So we were having libvert operations fail when we were doing things like a massive evacuation with a single target. And what it turned out to be was a concurrency, concurrency issue. So these are the values that we're using today successfully. Again, the slides will be presented, so you, no one has to worry about writing anything down. Um, these are the values that we're using today, and I figured it'd be helpful to, to show everyone and save some pain. Uh, to increase the level of concurrency of libvert to be able to deal with hypervisors that are running up to 50, 60 instances and have to be mass evacuated or evacuated onto. So this will allow you to get the, the level of concurrency that you need. Migration. Um, so this is an area that ends up being, um, gets us into the, the cattle uh, versus pets debate. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks in the space will say, well, you shouldn't be doing live migrations. You shouldn't worry about any of that. And if you need that, you should go to VMware. Uh, the reality is that business needs don't match um, what, our, what our views are on, on cloud. There's still the vast majority of applications out there end up being sort of special snowflakes. They're not instances that can programmatically be regenerated or reproduced rapidly enough or that users don't care about, as much as we'd all like that to be the case. So we have always felt that live migration is incredibly important, both from, uh, mainly from an operational standpoint. If we need to go do a kernel upgrade out across the hypervisors, that's us as operators need, needing to go and reboot those hypervisors. It isn't just some natural failure that occurs. And without having the ability to do a live migration, we wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable about taking down instances for our own maintenance, where if a hardware fails, you can just say, that's cloud, deal with it. So to give ourselves the flexibility that we need, we've always focused on making sure live migrations work. And there are important considerations in doing that. So let's talk about some of those. So first are the three different types of migration that are available to you in Nova. So the first is, is migrate. And migrate ends up being entirely cold, as in, I don't care what state your instance is, we're going to shut down that instance, and we're going to copy it around. I'll show you guys the code in just a second for this. It isn't the, uh, the, the most elegant operation. It's probably the crudest part of the libvert driver, but that's how, what it's intended to do. Uh, the second type of migration is a, is a live migration. And the live migrations, in contrast to a standard migrate, are handled almost entirely by libvert. So rather than going out and, and doing anything crude from outside of, of libvert and moving files around, uh, libvert is handling all of it. And then block migration is pretty similar to live migration. Uh, mo many of you are familiar with this. It's just moving the, the disks around, which makes it, of course, uh, a, a more risky operation because in addition to just moving the state, which, okay, worst case, you move the state, you fail at it, something blows up, okay, you lost the runtime state. But in this case, you're moving the disks around, so there's a lot more risk of losing the actual data on disk. Now, the risk is small, um, but it is there. So as I mentioned, Migrate uh, operates on an inactive uh, domain. Um, 
it uh, Libvirt really couldn't do anything during a migrate, even if it wanted to, because Libvirt is only intended to be run on active domains where the monitor is available to it. So basically, a socket connection uh, or a socket is becomes available at the moment. Cumu, a Cumu instance is launched, and at the point where the Cumu instance is down, there's no longer that socket, so Libvirt can't do it, anything. And frequently, you'll see that when a migrate is running or a resize is running, you'll see in Horizon, it'll say resize slash migrate. And the reason for that is there's really no differentiation in terms of the code path. They are exactly the same code path. And let's take a look at that. I mentioned this is not elegant at all. And you can see that by virtue of the fact that there's a ton of move operations and an act, a, a set of operations that are going against the disk here. And why is that bad? Well, the moment you're having to do something like RBD, which is the Ceph backend, none of this holds true. So this entire class or, or this entire method breaks horribly uh, at the point that you've got, uh, you've got R an RBD backend. So there's a lot of work that's been going, I think as, as part of the Nova group, there's been talk about refactoring and potentially eliminating migrate for quite some time, potential, or, or in large part because of issues like this. It's not using image backend, it's, it's highly brittle, but just looking at this at a high level and seeing all those shell outs can give you a pretty good sense for, for where it is. Um, the code paths being different doesn't help either. So I, you've got migrate and live migrate. So let's just say an operation is improved in live migrate. Some guard is put in place to make sure that you've got data integrity before and after the operation is executed. Well, that's not necessarily going to be the case for both migration forms. So there's a, a shared storage check that exists, for example, on live migrate, and there's a completely separate one that exists for the standard migrate function. So that's just one example of where having, having the two different uh, operations is problematic. And the other, the bigger one is that admins can frequently get confused. I think one of the biggest areas of confusion in general when we're talking about migrations for folks who are just becoming familiar with Nova and just starting to use it is why are there two? Why is there a migrate and live migrate? Live migrate should probably just fall back to doing the right thing. That, that isn't the case today, um, but, but now you'll see why. Um, live migrate, and this is a key, it's not live by default, and that's by configuration. And there's a number of reasons why it's not live by default. So if you go deploy Nova today without changing anything, let's just say you get the basic configuration in place to, have, uh, to get your environment up and running. The moment you do a live migrate, you're actually pausing the instances. So how do you get, I'll, I'll show what configuration is necessary in, in an upcoming slide to make this actually live and some of the considerations here that, that are important. Uh, so the first would be that there were substantial improvements in live migration throughput uh, in QMU 1.4 and 1.5. And there have been continued to be improvements there, but those two releases we're pretty heavily focused on, on improving the performance of live migration. So one was the amount of time it takes or the, the cutover period for synchronizing memory state, and the other was, for example, the total bandwidth that was available and could be used um, between hypervisor. So at this point, the recommendation is to use at least QMU 1.5. And that's what you're going to get anyway if you're running RHEL 7 or you're running at least Havana out of the cloud archive for Ubuntu. Um, and in contrast to what we saw for migration or regular cold migrate, Nova is offloading basically the entire uh, live migration function to Levert to handle. Uh, so there's a, a dozen different calls that are being made through QMU Monitor that we do not have to worry about whatsoever because Levert's handling all of that for us. So <clears throat> some of the mig migration code and even though this is live, and you would think it's going to be a lot more complicated because you're doing all of this memory state synchronization, look how much more simple uh, this code base is. If you look at it and you get to the, the core of it, really the only part that matters here is DOM migrate to URI. That's it. Everything else is just setting up to do it. That is the actual libvert call that's being made there, passing a, a target host, uh, adding up the flags, and then, and then passing in a couple of additional configuration values. So again, in contrast, 
much, much cleaner. So the configuration values that I was talking about a little, little bit earlier. Uh, ver migrate live, if you add that value to both uh, of the two configuration options there, and each one defines which flags are passed um, respectively into the migration uh, operations, that will turn your migrations into being live from being the previously being in the paused mode that, that ships by default. Um, we also recommend changing the CPU flags. When you first stand up Nova, uh, it's tending or leaning towards giving you the best possible performance for your VMs, which is great, um, except that if migrations are a key part of what you want to do, you have to have a baseline of what CPU flags are being passed. So really where this comes into play is you've got a cloud environment, you launch it with, let's just say, 100 hypervisors, then you add 50 more. Maybe the 50 more are a slightly new generation of CPU and expose a couple of new flags. Well, if you haven't guarded by having a subset of those flags exposed to the VMs, you can no longer migrate from the old uh, or from the new hardware back to the old. So we're using uh, the CPU64 RHEL 6 profile, which is available on Ubuntu. That isn't a Red Hat-ism at all. Um, there are implications of doing that to, to be careful about, but, but um, by and large, if migrations are important to you, it is something that has to be considered. Max downtime. You, you won't see a config value for this today in, LiveVert, in the LiveVert driver or in Nova, but it is incredibly important. And what this represents is the window in time or the period of time uh, that Cumul will allow before cutting over an instance from the source to the destination. Basically, by default, it's 30 milliseconds. And what that means is if within a 30 millisecond window, the cutover cannot occur, Cumul will keep synchronizing data until it thinks it can do that cutover in 30 milliseconds. The problem is that sometimes you cannot get into that 30 millisecond window. You've got a JVM or you've got something that's rapidly churning memory. That's why you've got live, mi live migrations that get hung up, and that's actually a large part of why live migrations are not enabled by default. So we've submitted patches into LibVirt to allow this because that's one of the prerequisites. Uh, there, was a, there was a restriction uh, over top of it that was preventing max downtime from being set. That's in a version of LiveVert that's coming, and we'll submit the patches upstream for that as well. For the time being, the easiest way to deal with this is actually to patch Cumul uh, and change the default uh, max downtime to even 10x what the default value is, and it'll make a massive difference in how rapidly migrations occur. Because even with a one-second uh, max downtime, it's plenty of time to be able to, or it's basically not noticeable if you're pinging the VM and you have a one-second max downtime. Uh, when that transition was to occur. So now some, uh, some general operational tips. So the most brittle operations that you'll find in Nova are always going to be anything that is uh, long running and synchronous. So again, migrations. Uh, suspend is another one that's long running and, and synchronous. And let me define what synchronous means. Nova will do quite a lot of threading, especially by default now. The LiveVirt driver is designed to use a threaded connection into the, the, LiveVirt, um, the LiveVirt daemon itself. But numerous operations within an individual thread will block until they return. Well, the problem is, if the compute process were to die in the middle of that, Nova has no idea what happened. So anything where that were to occur, let's just say you're in the middle of a live migration. You shut down compute on one side or the other, you bring compute back up, it's going to be up to you to clean that up. Nova has no idea where it left off to be able to pick that up. It's a known issue. Uh, it's something that, that folks have been working to resolve, but it's not an easy problem to solve. So basically, anything uh, that's going to take some time is just going to increase the window of exposure for you uh, and, and make, your, make things more prone to failure. Um, and there, the, Graceful stops have been put in, but it still doesn't deal with all of these cases. So again, it'll be an area to continue to improve upon, and really the only way to deal with this operationally now is to assess via the logs what was the operation that was done. And you, of course, you can automate this and determine you know, whether there are any uh, uh, operations running. Query the API, ask it before you shut down a hypervisor is probably the easiest way to do it. But uh, that's where things are at today. Um, 
to recover from these things is, is, is sort of challenging because, again, Nova doesn't know where it left off. So it's going to be up to you in a lot of these cases to go in and figure out what state the hypervisor was in at the point where the failure occurred. So look at the logs for exceptions. It might be stating the obvious, but you can generally uh, discern exactly what it is that happened just by reading the, uh, or looking at the exception. And now that you've got some idea of how to read the code, it might take some time, but you'll start to become familiar with, OK, let me go trace back exactly through the code what it is that occurred and understand exactly where things uh, fell off. The combination of reset state to active and reboot hard is pretty powerful. So once you've determined that you feel pretty confident in the state, let's say you know the migration died on the destination, you've cleaned things up appropriately, you can reset state and do a hard reboot, and things should generally get back to, to working again. Uh, and you might run into to cases where you're going to need to go in and brute force things. Kill minus 9. Actually, verse destroy, which is what Nova ends up doing, is pretty similar to kill minus 9. So if you end up needing to go that far, so be it. Uh, it's going to happen sometimes. There's nothing really wrong with it, aside from you know leaving a, an instance running uh, in a state that you don't trust anyway, so you might as well kill it. So yeah, uh, live migrations are, are one of these operations that can get stuck. Uh, the max downtime uh, alteration makes a big difference on this. So once that is available, um, and again, it is already in libvirt. It has been there, but it was blocking to only allow it to, to run when the instance was migrating. It, it gets complicated, but you couldn't then run it because it was a blocking operation. That's been sorted out. So that'll come in now into libvirt. But basically, if, if you have a live migration that gets stuck, the best thing to do is to make a backup of both sides of it, especially if it's a block operation and kill one of them. We usually kill the destination side. Uh, and you can generally tell that uh, one side, or which side it is that you should kill. Um, but killing it on the destination is generally the safest bet. Um, because if the live migration has not completed, Nova has not had an opportunity yet to go in and do any amount of cleanup. So everything should still be present on the source and destination. But again, it's important to emphasize that you should do some amount of investigation and understand the state before you go and start making uh, brute force operations, because you could lose data if you screw this up. So that's, uh, that's all we had time for today. Again, hopefully we can dive in some more uh, in a future talk, but I'm happy to take some questions. As long as everyone can hear you. Hey, hey. Um, I would like to ask if there's any work being done on the post copy Quimio and post copy live migration approach. The which approach, sorry? Uh, post copy live migration approach. I'm not familiar with it. Well, there is something because the current state of the live migration works with the pre copy memory, and that's why it's getting stuck. So. So it, it, chances are, yeah, I mean, uh, really, it's one of the areas that's continuously being evaluated. Even as far as the Juno code base, there's a, a new API call that's being used for uh, from libvirt into Qemu. I don't know if the, the new approaches are being used. What version of Qemu was that introduced in? Uh, I think this is not merged yet. This is just okay. a new feature on GitHub. And the main point is it shared the memory with the state and the with between the source and destination hosts, so I see. Yeah. yeah, so I I would say it's a pretty safe bet that once functionality makes it into Qemu, uh, it and then makes its way to Libvirt. If there's anything that Libvirt needs to do to take advantage of it, Nova will take advantage of it. Um, folks are pretty aggressive about uh, introducing that functionality, and there's generally a version check put around it. So, okay, if I have QMU, let's just say it comes into QMU 2.5 in the future, there'll be a check to say, is it in version 2.5, and, and take advantage of it if it's a separate call. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yep. So, uh, I'm not sure if this problem is relevant to, uh, you know, but you mentioned about Nova not knowing about, you know, the compute or the, you know, instance that has failed and yes. you have to clean up manually. 
so the similar situation I had was, uh, you know, our compute was, you know, kind of out, but NOVA was still trying to schedule instances on it. And uh, so how do you clean that up? So that that's a little deeper than, than just compute, because that goes back to why is it that that compute instance is reporting as being healthy to the scheduler, and the scheduler is still seeing that as a valid target. Um, that one's a little deeper. So we have seen that as well. That can be a number of different issues. Uh, and Chet Burgess, who's sitting in the front here, has probably spent the most time at, from, from our group investigating that sort of thing. But basically, there are numerous threads connecting back from co the compute driver into Rabbit. Uh, some of those are, for example, you, you have a thread that's listening on the receive queue. You have other threads that are are listening on reply queues or, or connected to reply queues. So what you can have, and chat, you can <laughs> correct if parts of this are wrong, but um, the, 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 the idea or the, the point there is you might have one or more of those threads that have become uh, wedged uh, or not connected or not connected to or subscribed to queues that are valid anymore. So there's a number of different reasons, but, but by and large, it, those sorts of issues generally come down to uh, a rabbit connectivity issue where the hypervisor or compute node is reporting in and saying, I'm good, when it's not actually good. Something's at wrong with one or more of the connections into rabbit. The, the cleanup is easier for us. The cleanup for that is we start the compute node. Yeah. Um, if you're almost certain what happened, you know, onion, whatever, come out for example, and lock up, um, and or uh, just delete the way that you do your instances, you'll probably show them what's Yeah. Probably we're actually out of time, but I'll take one more question if there's another or not. Uh, Hard to say. I couldn't tell you. I we've been focused so heavily on Levert, so um, yeah, it's I have no idea what the state is in VMware or Zen Server or Hyper V. Thanks, everyone. Uh